Hi everyone and welcome to Joy Church Grants Pass. We are so excited that you're here with us today and we're also so excited to announce that we are going back to live in-person services uh, February 7th, Sunday 10 a.m. at the Rogue Theater in downtown Grants Pass. Now we're also going to make sure that all of you who are watching online and who choose to stay home and watch the service online. We're gonna make sure that we have a great service prepared for you guys as well each and every Sunday. But we wanna let all of you know that we will be in person, Rogue Theater, downtown Grants Pass, every Sunday at 10 a.m. Yeah, so we are so excited. We're gonna be doing a family style service. We absolutely love being with the kids. We love being all together. And that is what we are gonna do in the first phase of us going back. So families, don't worry if you have little ones, we expect the chatter. Uh, we expect kids getting up and down. Obviously we ask that your kids sit with you, but we're gonna have fun activities for them to be doing during the service. Uh, we're gonna as always be having worship and a short break after worship so that you guys can resituate yourself in the seats. But we are very excited to be able to be back together, to fellowship and to have our family style services. Yeah, again, if you've got kids and you're worried about coming to church because your kids don't have kids church to go to, we just wanna let you know, don't worry about it. You're invited, your kids are invited. We're gonna make sure that they have snacks, that they have activities that they can do. It's gonna be a great time. And so we are, uh, we can't wait for all of you uh, to come back and join us for live services. Um, if you need more information, feel free to reach out to the church. You can email us, you can get a hold of us on social media. Um, you can call us on the phone. There are many ways to get a hold of us and we'd love to answer any questions that you have. So please feel free to reach out for any information, any concerns you might have. We can't wait to see you February 7th, 10 a.m. at the Rogue Theater. See you there. Right now we're gonna enter into a time of worship. So we just wanna invite you guys, wherever you're at, go ahead and sing along with us. The words are gonna be on the screen. Here we go. of the morning are inside your eyes the world awakens in the light of the day i look up to the sky and say you're beautiful oh, oh, oh. And galaxies are bright We are amazed in the light of the stars It's all proclaiming who you are You're beautiful Oh 
You bled and then you died and then you rose again for me. Now you are sitting on your heavenly throne. Soon we will be coming home. You're beautiful. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh. You're beautiful. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh. Let's see. You're beautiful, you're beautiful, you're beautiful. I see your face, you're beautiful, you're beautiful, you're beautiful. I see your face, you're beautiful, you're beautiful. You're beautiful I see your face You're beautiful You're beautiful You're beautiful I see your face God, you're beautiful You're beautiful You're beautiful No 
Jesus, I love you. Your holy, holy, so holy, holy, your holy, holy, Jesus, I love you, Jesus, I love you.
for you we open our hearts and we wait for you what a great time of worship together this morning right now we're going to welcome up pastor aaron for the message hey everyone welcome to joy church thank you so much for tuning back in. And if this is the first time that you're tuning in and joining us for church, we just wanna say thank you so much for being here. Uh, we feel privileged that you would jump on and uh, join church with us. We hope that you're having an excellent Sunday so far. We are smack dab in the middle of a sermon series that's entitled New Year Know Me. Hashtag New Year know me and yes that is a play on words you probably have all seen the hashtag on social media that is new year new me and um, a lot of people around this type of uh, this time of year talk about their goals and their resolutions for the new year and we've kind of taken a play on words uh, as regards new year new me because so much of human intuition so much of what the rank and file world, the, the just typical modern society tells you, it's been screaming in your face for uh, essentially your entire life through advertising and through TV and through other means, uh, that life is about you. It's, it's all me, me, me. It's what I need in life is to be happy. And in order to be happy, I need more stuff and I need more money and I need more people to notice me and I need more likes and more follows on social media. And without knowing it, without even being aware of this fact, uh, we can base our lives on uh, satisfying ourselves on, in looking for more and more stuff, more material goods, more money, more freedoms, more of everything in this buffet of life. And the Bible is really, it preaches a message that is very much opposite that. It is this idea that uh, in order to gain real, true, eternal life, we have to lose our life, this temporal earthly life. We have to give away ourself and give away our rights and give away our money and our time and our self. And in doing so, we look a lot more like this guy named Jesus, the son of God, who also came to earth and gave away. He gave away his stuff and his rights and he gave away his will. And eventually he gave away his life. But his example is that he gained real life. He gained eternal life, and he's willing to share that with you and I. And so this idea of new year, no me, I just, I just have to be honest with you. This is hard material to preach. This is, this is, this is difficult to, to convey, to get across, because I feel like, like it's basically the, the church version or the preaching version of what you experience if you have a, a child, if you have a kid and they watch TV, there's like, the PBS special that has like a $12 production budget and there's some helpful people and they're on this show and they're telling your kids, hey kids, um, you should eat broccoli and exercise. We love exercising. We love drinking water. We hate candy. And then a commercial comes on that's like a $27 million production by Reese's and essentially like baits your child into choking down gobs of delicious candy. I mean, it's difficult to convey if you want happiness and you want health, all you have to do is deny yourself and eat broccoli and exercise when you're competing with high dollar ads that they probably spend a million dollars on a focus group just to decide what what hue of orange to use on their packaging so that they can, they can uh, tempt more children into eating their candy. Sometimes speaking about these kind of subjects feels like that. It's like, hey gang, listen, all we have to do to achieve real life is just completely die to ourselves in torturous agony. Isn't that what you want? And I already know the answer because I'm a human being just like you are. The answer is no, I don't want that. All of these ads, all of this entire world, all of this social media, all of this noise in my life that is so constant that I forget that it's even there is screaming at me every day 
to get more, to have more, to take care of yourself, to do things that get you noticed, that appeal to your pride, to eat more and to make more and to whatever, more, 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 me, me, me. And that's why this series is called New Year, No Me. It's, it's dispelling this thought that, that happiness, that ultimate satisfaction comes through just concentrating on self and my hair and nails and do I have what I want? Because so many of us have walked down that road and we found out that it really never satisfies, that we really never find life there. We never find true joy. We just find that we want more and more and more. And so that's what this series is all about. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about um, this concept and really John the Baptist probably nails this on the head when he is, uh, he's approached by different disciples that he had out in the wilderness when he was preaching. And they said, hey, John, haven't you noticed that this guy, Jesus, he's preaching and, and his crew, they're baptizing and everyone's, they're, they're chasing this guy. Aren't you upset about this? Aren't you, aren't you bummed out? Don't you want to be the, the guy in the spotlight here? And John the Baptist replied, he said, aren't, haven't you been listening to me? It's only now that I'm truly happy. I, my whole ministry has been to introduce this guy, Jesus. In fact, he goes on to say, I must decrease so that he can increase. I must decrease so that he can increase. And that's what this series is all about. That's what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks is this, this concept of us decreasing, us becoming less and having less and life being less about ourselves so that it could be more about Jesus, both for ourselves and for those around us. So what does it look practically um, when you decrease so that Jesus can increase? I would suggest that it looks a lot like this. It looks like you not doing the things that you would normally do and you doing the things that you would not normally do. So not doing some things, and also doing some things that might not come natural to your human nature. Uh, we're working from this idea of original sin, this idea that human beings were created to be like God. We are created in His image, but we fell through the, the brokenness of sin and death coming into the world. We don't have desires that naturally line up with what God wants to do, with who He is, with what His character is is and and because of that because of original sin because of the fact that our appetites and our desires don't align with god we have a decision to make either either we give away some of our rights and some of our desires or we say god sorry if you want to if you want to be a part of my life um, you just have to make me happy. You just have to rubber stamp whatever I'm trying to do. And I'm just going to tell you from the outset that it doesn't work. In God's kingdom, he wants to be the boss. He wants to be on the throne and he will be on the throne. And it's, it's our great privilege and our great joy to be able to call him Lord and King and to get on board with what he's doing. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that humans naturally gravitate toward that, thus the reason for this series, but I'm telling you that that is the very best place you could possibly be. It's the best way that you can live. In fact, according to the Bible, it's the only way that you can live, that you can find real, true, eternal life. So last week we talked about prayer and prayer is the starting point. Prayer is one of those things where you really are saying, God, new year, know me. I, I am taking time out of my day to quiet down, to focus on you, to purposely and deliberately take a posture where I say, God, you are on the throne, your Father in heaven. It's about your will. It's about what you want to do on this earth. And I just want to join myself to you in that. Now, that was last week. So if you didn't get to see that one, make sure you jump online, visit our social, go and, and catch up on that one. And I, I have to tell you, I feel kind of bad after we got done preaching that sermon, after um, that one was in the books, I felt like, man, Aaron, you really painted prayer in this light that it is hard, it is difficult, it is just a struggle, it's agonizing. And you know what? I'm not totally backing off of that. It is a struggle. It, what I was trying to convey, and I still believe very strongly, and you will find, 
If you devote yourself to prayer is that our flesh, the natural part of us, it just does not often want to engage God in prayer. It does not want to quiet down. It doesn't want to slow down. It does not want to take a posture that says, God, it's about you and your will. It's not about me and my will. That, that runs contrary to our nature. It's difficult. The human flesh does not like it, but it is so, so good. It's the only way that you get to commune with Father God. Now, I feel bad because talking about prayer last week really cast it in the light of it being difficult. I feel especially bad because this week we're talking about something that many of you or maybe all of you will find even more difficult, and that is the subject of fasting. So what is fasting? Fasting is, well, first of all, it's how my wife drives our minivan. Second of all, it is in the Bible, it is, it is the concept of going without, of, of purposely um, choosing to forego something. Now, typically, biblically, it's talking about food. And I personally, um, I'm somewhat old school that I, I happen to think that that is the most normal, typical, biblical sort of fast. You're going without food for a certain portion of time. There are people who um, subscribe to the theory that there are other types of fasts, fasting from media, TV, social media, entertainment, etc. And I believe that those are helpful. I believe that you should engage in those. I believe that you should fast from various sorts of things that are distracting and uh, possibly uh, lead you to sinful areas, whatever. I think definitely fast from those. However, I think sometimes people choose those sorts of fasts because it's so gosh darn difficult to fast from food. And so that's the one that I recommend that you start with, that you try. Um, fasting is not foreign to the Bible. It's actually so commonly found throughout the Bible um, that I think that the concept of fasting itself is sort of assumed. It's mentioned over 50 times in scripture. It's all throughout the Old Testament. It's all throughout the New Testament, kind of all the way through. The Bible never says that like, hey, you have to fast. This is, this is a law, you have to do it, except for one Old Testament law where the Israelites were forced to fast from, from food completely uh, one day out of the year on the Day of Atonement. Um, the Bible is not really legalistic about it per se. The Bible mentions fasting a lot. Um, I think maybe the part that can get confusing is that the Bible is not, it doesn't break down the mechanics and say, this is what fasting is, and this is why we do it, and this is exactly what happens when you fast, and this is why it's important, etc. It just, there's not like a real clear theology of fasting or a, or a practical theology of fasting that's found in the Bible. But that's not to say that the Bible is silent about it. It's, the Bible isn't silent. It mentions fasting a whole heck of a bunch of times, but it mentions it in passing. It mentions it almost saying, when you fast. There's like a million passages that say, when you fast, when you start a fast, when you are fasting. Now, when you start a phrase, when you, you are presupposing that the person who's reading it is doing that thing or is going to do that thing, that it's just totally normal to the audience that it was written to. If your wife leaves and she says, oh, by the way, honey, when you clean the living room, um, will you please make sure that you dust the blinds? Now, she's not saying if you clean the living room. She's not saying if it just suddenly strikes you that you would like to do something nice. She's saying, I am assuming that you are cleaning the living room. I am presupposing that you are going to do that, therefore do it in this way. And the Bible talks that way a lot when it comes to fasting. It doesn't say here are 97 reasons why you should fast, it just says when you fast. And I think that we should really consider that because number one, in this day and age, well really in every day and age, fasting as like a hobby or a pastime is not popular, it's uncomfortable. but it might even be more so that way today. Probably most of us are not like waiting around excited about fasting, about going without food. You're just like, man, no, it's a Tuesday. I think, uh, I think I'll starve myself today. Most of us don't think that way. But the Bible makes it seem so commonplace that there are instructions almost in passing. Like, by the way, when you fast, like I already know you're gonna do this. Like, you'd have to be insane not to 
fast. I mean, I would never assume that you're not fasting. I mean, obviously, if you're a Christian or if you're a Jew, you're going to fast. And I think that we probably ought to take that somewhat seriously, that the Bible assumes that fasting is a fairly normal part of our life. Um, you can even hear this kind of language from Jesus, and especially in the context that we've been talking about. Now, last week, we were talking about prayer. We were talking about how do we embrace this concept of new year, no me. We are, well, what better way than by prayer? Now, when Jesus references prayer out of Matthew 6, uh, like we referenced last week, he says, when you pray. He didn't say, here are, you know, here's a blog I wrote of 12 reasons how praying can, can help you have a better life. He says, when you pray, because he is assuming that you pray, which I think the implication is fairly clear here. If you do not pray, there is a big problem. Now, he also says, after he goes through the whole section on prayer, he says what we're going to look at today, Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, it starts, and when you fast. So there's, there's something implicit in the text here, which means there is an, assu an assumption being made by Jesus. He is assuming that we fast. He is assuming that his audience, the people that he is talking to, fast. And you might be looking at me right now saying, Aaron, I have never fasted. I don't ever plan on fasting. If I have to go a day without getting my Taco Bell, um, I don't know what I'll do. Just like call the, the morgue because obviously I'm dead. I cannot go one day without eating. And I, I understand how you feel. It is not comfortable to go without eating. But Jesus is saying when you pray and also when you fast, and this should be a clue that a, a new me or a no me, us decreasing so that Jesus can increase, usually starts with us doing what he said to do. Thus, how we started this sermon, uh, us decreasing and him increasing probably practically looks a lot like us doing things that we might not normally do. And it also looks like us not doing things like eating that we would normally do. So Jesus goes on, he says, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. Don't look sad, don't look forlorn. You've seen this look before, the rounded shoulders, the lip, lip poking out. And we'd like to say that it's only kids that do that, but if you've been around adults for any period of time, you know that they are just as good at, at it as kids are. Don't look gloomy. Don't look sad. Don't look brokenhearted uh, like the hypocrites, meaning people who are acting like they're spiritual, but they're not. They're acting like they are, are full of faith. They're acting like Christians, but they're actually not. Don't look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. In other words, they make themselves look sad. They let their five o'clock shadow grow for you guys, hopefully. They, they look downcast, they look slumped, they look out of energy, all of this, because they want to, someone to ask them, oh, what's the matter with you? Oh, you don't look so good, is everything okay? They, they, they want people to know that they're fasting. But listen, it says, truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. What they are getting out of fasting is pity and an appeal to their pride by other people. Wow. You're spiritual, man. You went a whole day without eating. Whew, I could never do something like that, man. You must, you must really love God. Wow. Jesus is saying what these people are fasting for is to be noticed. They are, they are getting some kind of prideful, fake spiritual high out of it. And he's saying, do not do that. When you fast, don't do that. They've already received their reward. But when you fast, there's that phrase again when you fast, not if you fast, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. In other words, take care of yourself. Ladies, put your makeup on like normal. Guys, shave, shower, look like a normal human person. You're not fishing for some sort of spiritual compliment. Wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, Jesus is just sweeping the legs right here. He's just taking, he's taking all of what we could get from a human standpoint. He's taking the pride factor out of it. He's, he's, he's saying, 
when you fast, because I'm already assuming that you're going to, go without food, suffer some, but keep it secret from people and just let it be before uh, be before yourself and your God. Because what you are getting out of this is not somebody noticing how spiritual you are. What you are getting is that God will see that you are desperate for him, that he is more important to you than food is, and that you're willing to go without for his sake. And so that's the question. Why fast? Why do it in the first place, what is it for? And I think Jesus is revealing here that it's not some, it's not some magical formula that like, ooh, now God will really listen to you. Um, I, 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 whether that's true or not is up for debate. I think God listens to us. I think the problem is that we probably don't listen to God. And the reason why is because we have appetites that are screaming at us pretty much 24-7. And that, I think, is the reason, the most poignant, the most uh, serious reason that we would fast is because it automatically and instantly exposes our human appetites. Now, if, if you've tried to fast before, you know exactly what I'm talking about because literally just your appetite for food, it like reaches out and punches you in the face. Uh, you can go work for a day and forget to eat and you're totally fine. But the second that you decide, I'm going to fast, oh my gosh, food has never sounded so good in my life. All right, one time we were fasting and one of my kids was like, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna fast with you guys. I can't do it, I have to eat something. I mean, it was like seconds, that's how long, that's how long it took. I have a friend who, um, I, I think at this point in time, they have some kids, they, they had a minivan. And for any of you who have ever had a minivan, we have a minivan right now, the mommy missile, the silver bullet. And for whatever reason, even if you never go through McDonald's, somehow there are McDonald's french fries in your van all the time. You c I think they ship the van brand new with McDonald's french fries in the van, on the floor, under the seats. I mean, it's like, it's bizarre. I have no idea how it works. Like McDonald's has some kind of deal with minivan manufacturers, whatever it happens to be. And my friend was fasting. Now, you can just go a few hours when you know you're fasting, all of a sudden this evil appetite within you rears its ugly head and things that would be disgusting the rest of the time all of a sudden seem appetizing. He gets into the minivan and he notices that his kids are somehow mysteriously old McDonald's french fries appeared in the minivan. Now, I'm just telling you this right now. If you're not fasting, old McDonald's french fries are the most disgusting substance that have ever been perpetrated upon the human race. Like, they are not good, and there's no way to redeem them. They, nasty. But especially old nasty ones that have been in your minivan for a long time, God knows where, what they've been through, what kind of trauma they've seen, and he sits down in the minivan in his appetite from fasting. This psychological lack or absence of food caused him to see those french fries and to say, you know what? It is worth it for me to break this spiritual journey, this fast, and indulge myself on those nasty old minivan french fries. Now, I'm sorry, if that story doesn't encapsulate what fasting does to a person, I don't know what does. It, 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 it instantly causes us to, to uh, like do things that we wouldn't normally do, to notice things about ourselves that we wouldn't normally notice. It exposes fasting, going without, purposely, deliberately, it exposes these human urges that we have that I would suggest keep us from God. I think that our constant need to be filled with something. We need to be filled with food, and not just any food, food that's tasty and salty and fattening and sugary and, and the rest. Uh, we need to have something in our ears, whether it's the radio or a podcast or music or whatever. We need to have something in our eyes. We need to be watching some sort of entertainment. If we have to, God forbid, stand in line at the bank, which who even needs to go to the bank anymore because you can do it all online. But if you have to, if you catch yourself standing in line for 
two minutes. God forbid you strike up a conversation. You have to have Facebook or Instagram or something going into your brain. I mean, it's like we, we don't even notice our appetites. And that is the nature of appetite is that we have this, this vacuum inside of us, this hole that, that we always feel like it needs to be filled. The problem is no matter how often you fill it, it never feels more full. You never feel satiated. You never feel like you can get enough. And fasting is one of those things that instantly forces you to come face to face with yourself. You go, oh my word, I didn't realize how controlled I was by fill in the blank. Usually it starts with food. You go a little bit of time without without food, you realize I am cranky, I'm yelling at everybody, I have all these crazy urges, I, I'm just like, ooh, and it, and it busts you out of your, your normal box, it busts you out of your normal routines, and you notice, I, I self-medicate with a lot of things. I cover up those spaces, those, those precious whispers, it sounds like an 80s band, precious whispers, Those that, that still small voice of God that might be trying to seep into my consciousness, that might be trying to get through this rat race of noise and traffic and, and media and news and all of it. It might be that God is trying to do something amazing with my life, that God is really trying to lead me into some places that would be life-giving, that would be absolutely revolutionary in my world, but I don't even notice it. I can't see it. I, I can't hear it because I'm so busy stuffing myself with everything that I can find. Fasting is saying enough. Enough. Appetites, you're not going to get the best of me. Urges and desires and temptations, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the brakes on all of that. I'm going to go without so that it will expose to myself and to my God the fact that I likely have been ignoring who God is and what he has to say to me. New year, no me. So what should we do? How should it look? Well, in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, he was a prophet and God revealed to him what true fasting and what false fasting looks like. And I think this goes right along with every other passage about fasting, including when Jesus talked about it. Isaiah chapter 58, we're going to read most of the chapter. It says, cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. He's saying this to Isaiah. In other words, scream this at my people because I need them to know this. Cut through the noise like a trumpet does. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Sounds like they're in the right place. Listen, this is them asking rhetorically, why have we fasted? and you see it not. God, why have we fasted and you don't seem to take notice? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. You seek to fulfill your own appetites and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist, another 80s band name. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. That's a huge statement. Fasting in the wrong way will not make your prayers get through. You have to do it the right way. There is a true fast, there is a false fast, and you, Israel, are doing it wrong. It says, is such the fast that I choose? And this is God speaking in a series of rhetorical questions. He's saying, is this the kind of fast that I'm I'm after? And the implication is no. It says, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Now, that sounds like a pretty good fast. These people are spreading sackcloth and ashes under themselves and they're bowing their heads down and and you think, yeah, 
Externally, that, that really looks like these people are humbling themselves before God. The problem is he's speaking to a people that are legalistic. It's all external. Th these are people who they want, they want their pleasures and their appetites satiated, but they want God to be God at the same time. And God is saying, no, fasting isn't about you getting what you want. Fasting is about you becoming less like yourself so that you can become more like me. And you'll know that it's taking place. You'll know that it's happening. You'll know that you're doing it right when you go into this next section here. God says, is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness. To break people out of their addiction and their sin cycle. To undo the straps of the yoke. To let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke of, of slavery, of bondage. Listen to this. It says, is it not to share your bread with the hungry? Not necessarily, hopefully some governmental program will take care of it. He's saying the fast that I've chosen, you might be going hungry because you're sharing your bread with people who don't have enough to eat and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, other humans. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, listen to this, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, not satisfying your own desires, not taking care of your own appetites, but going without purposely in order to satisfy the needs and the desires of others, not sinful desires, but to take care of others who need it. If you pour yourself out for the hungry, satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire. God will actually satisfy the deepest desires of your heart not the surface level fleshly desires that we have, but when we give ourselves to the degree that we fast from those desires, God will satisfy the real, true, deepest parts of us and the true desires of our hearts, maybe possibly ones we don't even know are there, and we certainly don't know how to fill. God will satisfy those desires in a scorched place and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters do not fail and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt you shall raise up the foundations of many generations you shall be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of streets to dwell in god is saying here you've tried fasting your way you, even externally, you have looked like a person who is religious. You have, you've played the part. But I'm not looking for people to look religious. I'm looking for people who fast because they want to end up like me, God. They, they want their lives to change. They want to be exposed to themselves to the degree that they change into the sort of person like is described here. Someone who functions like God functions. Somebody who goes out of their way and goes without in order to make sure that other people are taken care of, that they're loved the way that God would love them. People who fast and they go without so that they could be them, their real selves before God, not some, some fake imitation of who they are, so they could have real relationship with God. It's a totally different concept. It's fasting to be seen, fasting to kind of fulfill some religious obligation that you might know of, but you're not really, you don't really, your heart's not in it, you don't really know what it's for, versus fasting because you want to say, God, I want to empty myself of everything. I literally want to empty myself of food. I literally want to decrease, meaning I'm, I'm losing 
my flesh. I literally am losing weight. I'm losing the satisfaction of being full of food. I'm losing the satisfaction of entertainment and spending time just doing things that I would, I would naturally be drawn to do. I'm losing that. I'm literally decreasing. I'm doing less of what I would naturally be drawn to do so that I could do more of those things that maybe I wouldn't naturally be drawn to do, like take care of another person, like spend time deeply in prayer, talking to you, God, face to face, and really learning the real you and letting, and letting you come invade my heart and, and find out who the real me is. That's a, it's just a totally different concept. And hopefully, hopefully throughout this series, you're able to make that decision for yourself. And it looks different for each person. Some people are in a place where they really have a, a handhold here and they, um, they do this stuff more naturally and it comes easier for them. Maybe you have never prayed, maybe you've never fasted and you say, man, it would be a real struggle for me to just go one meal without eating. It'd be a real struggle for me to just spend 10 minutes in undivided attention and prayer with God. I would say start there. Be humble enough to admit, hey, I don't have everything figured out. I'm not some super Navy SEAL Christian, but I'm willing to start. I'm willing to journey. I'm willing to get better if God will meet me in this place. You know, it's interesting. There have been studies that have been done when people fast, physical studies. There was someone who, a man who he, he fasted for 40 days for religious purposes, and he was, he was measured by doctors in a lab, and they found out that his body secreted something like 12 to 1300 percent the level of what's called human growth hormone. Human growth hormone, if you're in sports and you're caught taking human growth hormone, you will be stripped of your titles, you'll lose Olympic medals, you'll be kicked out, I mean, kicked out of Hall of Fame. It's a very, very potent hormone that the human body is capable of producing. It causes your muscles to grow. It causes fat to shrink and to go away. It causes your bones to become more dense. It causes your brain to function better and basically be younger. It's like a fountain of youth. And they found out that in the fed state, human beings don't produce that much of it. But when your body is in an unfed state, when it's fasting, when you go without food, your body starts cranking it out 12 to 1300 percent of the usual amount that's produced in your body. It's because your body knows in, in the absence of food, I need to get with it and preserve and make sure that I take care of those things in the body that are important to life. And I don't think that there could be a better word picture for what happens on a spiritual level when we fast. I think fasting produces the spiritual growth hormone in the human machine. I think that when we go without, when we go without food, when we go without pleasure, when we go without distraction, and we, and we, we decide to purposely put ourselves in a place of lack, where we say, Jesus, I don't want all of these other distractions. What I want is, is you. I want your voice. I want your company. I think what happens is that our spirit starts to crank out spiritual growth hormone. And it says, okay, now we are in a place where we're not worried about every other thing. You're in a place, your soul is in a place where you are worried about those things that matter the most, that the things that pertain to life. Just like your body starts worrying about the things that pertain to physical life, I think your soul starts to worry about the things that pertain to spiritual life. And no matter how much we want it, you can only get horse, uh, human growth hormone in an illegal way if you're not willing to fast. And I think that when it comes to spiritual growth, same way, there's no shortcut. There's no injection. There's no pill that we can pop. I think the only way is the direct way, which is to say, God, it's worth it to me. I'm willing to go without some things so that I can gain you. I can gain your company. I can hear your voice. I can experience your leading. And I can get to the place where I'm humble enough to bring my real self to the real God and allow you to see who I am with all my appetites, all my distractions, and I'm at the place where I can say, Jesus, 
This is who I really am. You can have all of me. You can have the good and the bad, even though it looks like there's a lot more bad, if you're willing to take me as I am and to turn me into something that you want. Jesus, I don't even totally know what it is that I'm supposed to be, but I trust that you do. And whatever it costs, if you'll journey with me and you will give me life and you'll turn me into that person, I'll be yours. And if that's you, I'd invite you to pray this prayer along with me. Dear Jesus, the world is so loud. Everyone is vying for my attention. And oftentimes, I give my attention. I give it to everyone else besides you. And I repent. I ask that you would forgive me of sin doing my own thing, living my own life. It's your life that I'm after. And if I need to fast, I need to pray, I need to go without, I will, because it's worth it. Thank you for your work on the cross, for your sacrifice, for me. In Jesus' name, amen. What an awesome message from Pastor Aaron this morning. We just wanna thank you guys so much for tuning into church today. And just to remind you guys, we will be back in person at the Rogue Theater on Sunday, February 7th. It's gonna be a great time together, 10 a.m. So invite your friends, invite your family. We're gonna be following the, the COVID safety protocols, masks, hand sanitizers, but we cannot wait to be together. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at joychurchgp at gmail.com. You can always stay up to date by visiting our website, joygrantspass.com. It's been an awesome Sunday. We'll see you guys right here next week.